Hi everyone, I'm Kathy Lenatra, State Representative of the 12th Plymouth District, representing the towns of Kingston and Plimpton in parts of Halifax, Pembroke, Plymouth, and Middleborough. Thank you for joining me for the next installment of Profiles. This program allows me to take time each month to highlight the unsung people, programs, and events that make the 12th District so special. I hope you enjoy these stories as much as I do. On today's show, I'm joined by Mark DeCristoforo, Executive Director of the Massachusetts Seafood Collaborative, a broad-based coalition of harvesters, processors, and wholesalers who are dedicated to the success and the advancement of the seafood industry. Mark has spent years in public service, working both for state and federal elected officials who have been champions of the fishing industry. His job with the Mass Seafood Collaborative has allowed him to live out his passion of people, conservation, and promoting local communities through the fishing industry. Welcome, Mark. It's so glad to see you. Thank you so much for having me, Representative. It's an honor to be here with you. Oh, it's so funny that you call me Representative. You can just call me Kathy on the show. All right, it's much good easier. Deal. <laughs> <laughs> but tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get started? So you didn't start with Mass Seafood Collaborative. How did you start? Sure. So, uh, I mean... I'll go into the, the long version of it, if you don't mind. Not at all. Um, you know, so I grew up in, uh, actually in uh, kind of rural New Jersey in a family that weren't professional fishermen or, or sportsmen or anything, but took sporting very seriously. So uh, I always had a passion for the sea and, and, for, and for, you know, fishing and hunting, among other things. Um, so that was sort of ingrained in me from being a young person. Uh, I went off to college in South Carolina, coastal South Carolina, where I continued to, you know, um, take advantage of of being close to the ocean and yeah. you know, enjoying, you know, going out on the boat and fishing and everything. But uh, once my college career ended in 2015, I headed up to Washington D.C., where I uh, worked for Congressman Frank Pallone from uh, New Jersey. I believe he's the I don't remember his district honestly <laughs> anymore. Okay. But uh, so he represented a portion of coastal New Jersey that um, it's one of the few remaining fishing areas in the New York City kind of, you know, general metropolitan area. So uh, under his uh, tutelage, I think I learned <clears throat> a great deal about, you know, sort of the fact that the industry actually has issues that it faces. Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't my focus when I was there, and I just kind of did, you know, various other things as a, as a very young staffer. But, uh, you know, after some years, I decided it was time for me to you know, explore the uh, the private sector. So that's when I came up to Boston, a city I had always wanted to live in since I was a young person. It is a great to, city. Truly it is a great is. city. We used to come on vacation up here to Cape Cod and everything, again, adding to my uh, my romantic vision of, <laughs> of New England fishing. Um, so came up here, worked in the private sector for a little bit, but then I felt the uh, the pang of, of government and politics once again. Um, and I managed to... Uh, be lucky enough to take a position with uh, State Senator Bruce Tarr out of Gloucester. Oh, yes. So he, for people that may not know, um, down on the uh, South Shore, has been a great champion of the fishing industry in Massachusetts for his entire career, you know, many, many years. Mm -hmm. So when I was with him, I got, you know, kind of fell into, I guess you could say, dealing with fisheries issues. Um, <clears throat> when the pandemic hit, that's that's when things started to, you know, really illuminate. What happened was the negative impacts that the fishing industry was facing started to become illuminated mm -hmm. um, due to the fact that people weren't going to restaurants anymore to right. order fish. Um, so uh, a number of larger stakeholders in the Commonwealth went to the senator and said, we'd love for you to start an organization that represents everybody. And he kind of passed the baton to me on that. And um, from there... I helped them get off the ground and get things running, and they said, well, would you like to come do this um, full-time, pending the senator's uh, approval, you know, letting me go? And uh, it all worked out, and I was very happy to do it, because as you said in your intro, you know, kind of ties together things that I'm passionate about. Right, right. You know, we're working on conserving not just, you know, the sea and our ecosystem, but conserving an important way of life, conserving an important, um, you know, sustainable local food source that we're going to need for many years to come, especially as the world begins to shrink a little bit. Yeah. And um, obviously I get to deal with people on, you know, all sorts of levels, but of course I get to keep my fingers in politics a bit. 
um, which is exciting, and get to hang out with lovely people like yourself. Oh, you're so sweet. You're <laughs> so sweet. Well, we know that the fishing industry and the lobster industry in particular is so important to the 12th Plymouth District. So we have the coast. I represent the coast of Duxbury, Kingston, and Plymouth which is a hub, you know, yeah. Plymouth itself is a hub, especially with oysters as well. We have a lot of oyster farms. But I was fortunate enough to meet some of your colleagues, um, some lobstermen, and that was really yeah. interesting. Uh, so talk about some of the things, the challenges that they're facing now. After the pandemic, people are back to restaurants. I mean, the restaurants yeah. are busier than ever. Um, and people are back to oysters, they're back to lobster. I know the price was pretty high this summer. Um, but what are the challenges there? What are they facing for challenges now? Yeah, so it, so it's actually quite interesting. You know, you think of Massachusetts as you know one state, and mm -hmm. you know all our fishermen have the same issues, but it's actually not the case at all. We have actually quite different issues. Um, you know, whether it's in the ground fish industry in Gloucester, or you know, like in uh, your district down here, of which mm -hmm. I think I'm still a part until redistricting. But um, but so yeah, primarily what we have down here is oysters and or or aquaculture mm -hmm. and lobstering. Um, those two industries have been, you know, historically and especially lately, very successful. But um, both of them face acute dilemmas at the present moment. <clears throat> um, I'll start with the oyster industry. Mm -hmm. um, they have been threatened by the Holtec Corporation, um, as I'm sure a lot of people are aware, with uh, dumping uh, of, uh, I, I forgot what they call it, wastewater, radioactive right. wastewater yes. into our bay. Um, you know, the bottom line is that we, we can't allow that to happen because we don't want to take even one chance with our beloved, you know, whether it's Duxbury, mm -hmm. Kingston, Plymouth oysters. Right. And uh, particularly, you know, when um, England just recently announced that they're for the first time going to start allowing only Massachusetts oysters into their country. So we should not uh, deprive them by, right. by allowing that industry here to be, um, you know. To be threatened. Right. right. To be threatened, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, so, so I do <clears throat> want to say, though, I think, you know, we've had a lot of grassroots action and a lot of, yes. you know, great action by, you know, you and your colleagues in the state house to ensure that this dumping does not occur. And I'm, like I said, pretty confident, um, you know, whether they're forced to or whether they do it voluntarily, we're going to we're going to be successful. And, and it does seem like we're on a rising road when it comes to that. Um, and then obviously the, the other issue for oystermen is to continue, you know, getting their products promoted as far away as South Carolina. You know, I remember in college we had Duxbury oysters in yes. Charleston, South Carolina. So, so uh, it's a matter of marketing and making sure everybody mm -hmm. knows we have this great product here. Uh, lobsters is a little bit different. You know, that's a little bit more of an established fishery. Um, but, you know, we have been, you know, always, lobsters in particular in the fishing industry, the most regulated of any of the, the various types of fishing. Mm -hmm. And uh, believe it or not, they're actually the most compliant. They're 95% compliant. They're more compliant than uh, you know, the construction industry or, or various other uh, industries. I have read that. Yeah. Yes, yes. I've done my research, I did read that. There you go. Yes. So um, with that being said, uh, you know, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, a, you know, just about as geographically far from New England as you can be in the continental mm -hmm. United States, who counts among their board members uh, Actors such as the Nestle Corporation, who are, are famous for degradating the environment and uh, being just generally bad actors, um, they have decided to release their annual red list, which is essentially who they suggest you should stop buying from. And uh, on that list, they included Atlantic Lobster. Mm -hmm. um, their reasoning was that um, they believe it is too much of a danger to the North Atlantic right whale. And, uh, which was just kind of ironic coming from a chief uh, imprisoner of you know, 75,000 animals that they have at the aquarium there. But the um, point is, uh, we have in Massachusetts, like I said, a fishery that is 95% compliant, with, mm -hmm. which is, like I said, more than most other industries. Um, number two, we have closures for when these whales are in our waters. Um, and those closures are prolonged if the whales remain. Yes. Um, we also have a requirement for weak gear. So if, you know, a, anything about 35 pounds, I believe it is, you know, comes into contact with one of our vertical lines, um, the vertical line breaks. So these are, all, these are all protections that are in place that we take very seriously mm -hmm. because, you know, 
fishermen know more than anybody the importance of a balanced and a strong ecosystem. And, and that means everything from the smallest plankton to the largest whale needs to you know, remain there. And, and they don't want to see uh, right whales killed or, or taken off the face of the right. earth either. Um, with that being said, um, something that people often don't recognize or remember um, when they read these sort of silly you know, declarations from some far off aquarium is that uh, the last time we had a, a Massachusetts line you know, identified on a, a, uh, a whale carcass, yeah. excuse me for That's the, okay. the, no. the ugly uh, mm -hmm. imagery, but the last time we had that was 2018. And generally speaking, it is pretty well established that the shipping coming from overseas through mm -hmm. the Gulf of St. Lawrence, which yeah. is obviously north of New England, um, are primarily responsible for most right whale fatalities. You know, what will happen is they will strike the right whale out in the wide open ocean, and subsequently, you know, once they've been struck, they'll be confused, disoriented, and then in those cases, somehow find themselves tangled. And in a lot of instances, it's not even necessarily our line. Right. Um, so with that being said, um, you know, we are extremely careful. We are extremely cognizant of these animals, and we care more than anybody about maintaining their existence. Um, so I just think it's very important for people to recognize that, you know, Whole Foods, again, you know, not a corporation, you know, Amazon, obviously, mm -hmm. the owner of Whole Foods, that I think we should be being dictated to, you know, by, we're talking about local people who care about their environment, mm -hmm. who care about their communities, and this is the basis of a lot of our communities, especially here in Plymouth. Right. Um, you know, local people should not be bullied by these large you know, really, you know, international based corporations that don't really know what we're doing over here mm, and mm -hmm. that really are looking for clicks. I mean, I, I noticed uh, a while back when I was doing a little research on the Monterey Bay Aquarium, uh, it doesn't seem as though there's a lot of adults over there. They uh, recently had a, a tweet in which they made some uh, fat joke. So, you know, oh. it just, just not a very serious there's, organization. Right, right. You know, so I just, I never tire of pointing out the, uh, you know, the, the various discrepancies in, in uh, you know, their actions and their words, um, you know. What do you think they have to gain by doing that? That's, uh, that's what I was wondering. when I read that same article that you did about the red listing and um, in knowing that here in the Commonwealth that we're 95% compliant. Mm -hmm. And it's not that way, I don't think, across the country. No, it's not. So how is, are they that way in Maine? Do you know anything about Maine? So, so, Maine, so Maine and Massachusetts, insofar as our mm -hmm. lobster fishery goes, are, are Pretty well similar, okay. and, and we're very close with. Um, there's a there's the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association who mm -hmm. we work very closely with okay. as well on this and the offshore wind issue. But uh, in, in regards to this, um, I think the reason that they're kind of going at us. I mean, to give them the benefit of the doubt, the the Atlantic right whale. There's no doubt that the most dangerous part of their journey is going through New England waters mm -hmm. um, and, and North Atlantic waters, where there is a lot of shipping. Um, so you know, perhaps out of an abundance of caution, but, you know, that's kind of zero-sum game thinking. And, and my assumption is that, you know, on the on the cynical side, I think they probably have to gain clicks. They have mm -hmm. to gain, you know, more donations by, by virtue signaling, you know, uh, investment bankers and, mm -hmm. and whatnot in order to, you know, keep their operation running. And then on the other side, you know, one has to grant them that there are probably thoughtful people there that simply don't want to see fishing anywhere. And and you know, fishing anywhere obviously, or or any sort of you know, industry anywhere is a threat to nature everywhere. So mm. so you know, I, I guess that would be my, my suspicion. That a kind of like I said, a, a double barrel between people that you know, or genuinely believe that right. we, sh we should have absolutely no fishing, and then people who are just kind of on more or less the marketing side of things. The fishing has been around for generations and generations, and it seems to be a generational thing. Yeah. You know, your grandfather, your great-grandfather, and it goes um, down the line. Do you see that now, or do you see generations splitting into different occupations? So that's actually a, that's a, a very, very, very good point. Um, so, yes, it has been an extremely generational thing, and almost the majority of uh, you know members of the fishing industry here in Massachusetts if they're not the direct descendants as in their parents, um, mm -hmm. you know, they've got somebody very close to them that was involved in the fishing industry. And, and that's good, but it is something we do wanna start trying to change a little bit. 
because you know there's a phenomenon we're facing right now called the graying of the fleet, um, mm -hmm. which means that a lot of members of our industry, particularly the guys that are actually out at sea, not just the processors, um, are, are getting older, and there's not enough young people getting involved. And we ascribe that probably to a, a certain misapprehension and misconception amongst people that this is, you know, somehow not a, a worthy occupation. And, and that's a narrative that we're really hoping to change, mm -hmm. especially in the Commonwealth, because, you know, as, as we see, you know, skyrocketing student loan costs right. and everything, and, uh, and the reality that there's simply, you know, not everyone can have a or should have a job behind a computer screen, we have this great option. Uh, you know, you can go work outside, you can work, you know, harvesting and feeding Americans, or harvesting food to feed Americans, and, um, you know, you can work in a rewarding industry where at the end of the day you can look at what you did. Um, it's not the fishing industry of the 70s where there's, you know, maybe some, some not so nice elements. Um, so part of our mission is definitely to emphasize, and hopefully with the help of you guys at the State House, um, encourage young people to get involved in this industry. It doesn't require uh, a great, you know, learning curve to get in on the ground floor, but the possibilities for advancement are, are, are really high. I mean, you know, you can make really good money being a captain, or, you know, if you go the processing route, you know, start mm -hmm. on the floor, learn how the fish is cut, you can end up the manager of that plant and, and really have a, a rewarding career. And that's something we're, we're really trying to, like I said, emphasize because, you know, once the fishermen go away, um, we're not going to have that local protein. We're not going to have that right. local sustainable right. food source. And if we don't have that, we're going to have to get it from somewhere. People aren't going to stop eating fish. No, and we're known for our seafood, you know, oh. our local seafood. We're known for that. I do see that through a lot of industries, not just the fishing industries, but the trades as well. Yeah. You know, we have a lot of people that are starting to retire, and we don't have enough young people coming in. And I speak quite frequently about the... Uh, the college degree, like having the four-year degree or the two-year degree, and I'm really into certificate programs now. You can stack your certificates, uh, and it's less costly, right? Mm -hmm. Or if you go into the trades, right? Yeah. Go into something you're interested in. Within four years, you're making six figures without any debt, right? Exactly. So I think the stigma of days past, well before your time, my day, <laughs> um, was if you went to a vocational school, it's because you didn't have any other option. And really, it should the, the script needs to be flipped there. Really, the trades or going into fishing industry or the sea, or I mean, that's living your passion. Absolutely. That's living your passion, like you said. I grew up on boats. My parents always had a boat, so I understand the passion of the sea and being out in the water. Um, not a great fisherman. I was not a great <laughs> fisher person. We went on a uh, Captain John boats a couple times, deep sea fishing. It wasn't, wasn't great for me. Well, that's but... why you leave it to the professor. <laughs> Right? Yes, leave that to the professionals. <laughs> but I mean, to live your passion and make money at it, I think is so important for our younger people to realize that they can accomplish that. Yeah, and, right? and you're really part of, uh, I mean, something quite larger than yourself. You know, it's, you're, you know, if you're working at Twitter, you're not really part of something larger than yourself. But if you're, if you're working at a profession that has operated consistently for the last 400 years on these shores, you know, you have a heritage and obviously it's the heritage of everyone in the Commonwealth, but in particular, those members of it um, that you could really be proud of. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, above your very chamber, there hangs the sacred cod. Yes, yes, I was so, gonna bring that up. I'm glad you did. Yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, so it's, 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 no, it's no small thing. And, and you know, that, that's the other thing. There is certainly a cultural aspect that mm -hmm. we wanna maintain, you know, New England for that. People come to New England to see, to see you know, uh, quaint seaports, whether it's you know, Plymouth down yeah. here, or whether it's, or you know, Gloucester, Snug Harbor in Duxbury, yeah. Gloucester, oh, yeah. Chatham, yeah. whatever. And, um, you know, they don't want to come and look at Disney World. They don't want to come look at a, a, something fake. They want to see something real. And, right. and, and they want to see a, an active port. I mean, sometimes they're not the, the most glamorous when they're truly active, but, but that's the point, is that they want to be able to see fish coming in and know that they can go into uh, a shack or somewhere, you know and get the fish that was just in the sea. Right, that's fresh. Yeah. Exactly. So. I agree, I agree. It's just we need to be able, there has to be a balance. You right. know, there has to be a balance, and I think there is. But I did meet a wonderful woman, a young woman through you, and I can't remember her name, but she's a fisherman. Olivia Mashad. So yes. She is, Olivia Mashad, she, uh, she lives in Sandwich, and she fishes out of Plymouth. She mm -hmm. fishes for mussels. Um, and uh, she is she is my favorite person because I like to hold her up as as a great example. She is she, a great example. She's bright. She's well spoken, and you know she likes to have fun.
but you know she works her trade and she works it and she does it very well and she makes good money and she lives you know as good a life as anybody mm -hmm. certainly and she's young yes yeah, she's she's significantly younger she, than even myself right, i think yes. she's about 20 something or, she was i don't even know if she, if she was 21 yes i did meet her at a brewery i was so, gonna yes. say she's old enough to so have she a beer. was 21 <laughs> But, but no, she's a, she's a great example of what we want to encourage. Mm, I was you know. so impressed by her. I spoke to her for a long time, and I couldn't remember if if it was in her family or not. Was fishing in her family? Yeah, so her, okay. her, her dad's also a fisherman. Okay, that's uh, right. Her yeah. dad, Len, has been a fisherman for many years. But, you know, you know, while we still have a couple minutes, I'd love to bring up one last sure. issue that kind of maybe stops people from considering this career is, you know, we just talked about some some of the issues we have, but... The fishing industry is the most, you know, heavily regulated, only behind uh, uh, oil and gas mm -hmm. in the United States. And and like I said, we've got you know the NGOs and and those sorts of people going after us for various, you know, whether it's altruistic or or not so altruistic reasons. Um, when people see possible impediments to their ability to make money in the future, they're less likely to get involved. So so with that all being said, uh, one that has you know, I, I've actually talked to people that it g gives them pause is um, the offshore wind energy mm -hmm. development that we're considering in this Commonwealth. And, um, you know, f like I said before, fishermen have more of an interest in combating climate change than any other constituency. We live here. Mm -hmm. We want to absolutely make sure that, and, and we also make our living based on the seasonality of fish coming here right. to certain, certain climactic waters. Um, so, we, like I said, we have as much an interest in any in, as anyone, but uh, because we have that deep, passionate tie and interest in conservation and and fighting uh, climate change, you know, we want to make sure that offshore wind is done in a sustainable and a conservation-based way. Um, so, you know, for example, right now, where if we were to build every single offshore wind plant off the coast. Um, there would be essentially the state of Delaware and the state of Rhode Island sitting off our coast. And uh, in each one of those wind farms, there would be the, uh, the turbines are taller than the Prudential Center. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's difficult to picture that, but picture it if you could. Um, what we're kind of really saying is that we know that wind needs to be one of the answers to the climate change issue, but it's not a silver bullet. And we need to ensure that we don't, in the pursuit of net zero, ruin other industries or put other industries right. out of business. Right. So you guys did a great thing um, on the climate change bill uh, this past spring by including a fisheries commission. Yes. And, and that's what we want to be able to do is be at the table mm -hmm. during these conversations and say, you know, this is a place that's very important for fishing. Maybe we should not build there right away. Let's take a little time. Let's, let's be measured about this. You know, we don't want to make the same mistakes the first industrial revolution um, in the second one, as we move towards a, a green industrial revolution. Right. I agree. Uh, so that amendment was put in by myself and Rep Ferrante. Right, who was exactly. from Gloucester. So that's very important, and we talked about that. I wish we had more time, but I just briefly, I was in Canada recently talking about energy, and hydropower was so huge yeah. there. Um, and we did bring up offshore wind, and they wanted nothing to do with it. Although I have to say their, their aquaculture is much more st is stronger than ours, where they can use that hydropower. But it was fascinating to me. So love offline, we'll have to talk about yeah. that sometime because that was really interesting. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I'm so glad that you could come visit us today. You'll have to come back. I would be delighted Because I know there's to. so many more things that we could touch upon. Oh, I'm sure you and I could spend about three hours talking on I this show. I think you should run for office. It'd what do you think, Christine? <laughs> You're not in my district, right? You don't live in my district. No. Okay. <laughs> It might yes. be very boring for everybody else, but I'm sure uh, you and I could entertain ourselves for a great <laughs> long time. <laughs> we could. So thank you, Mark, for visiting us today. And we'll have you back soon. Absolutely. And we'll see, get some updates. And we'll be right back for the State House Minute. <music> Typically, I like to leave viewers with some news from the State House. Today, I want to leave you all with a sincere thank you for re-electing me to another term as your state representative. It has been the greatest honor of my life to serve in the Massachusetts House of Representatives, representing the people of the 12th Plymouth District. Together, we have been able to accomplish so much in my four years in office, from to securing funding for the district, to passing legislation addressing issues in health care, our education system, and so much more. It has all been a pleasure, 
and I am looking forward to the new session beginning in January and continuing to concentrate on important issues like mental health, elder affairs, and public safety. I am always available to discuss issues that are important to you and challenges you may be experiencing. My office will continue to assist in any way that we can. I want to thank Mark for joining us today and for his work promoting and protecting our blue economy. Seafood is a huge part of the Commonwealth's economy. The fishing industry is facing challenges from numerous sides, but thanks to people like Mark, they have people advocating for them. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join us next month for Profiles with myself, Kathy Lenatra.